released. How psychophysics and neurophysiology can improve our food choices. Per Möller, professor at the Department of Food Science at the University of Copenhagen. On the 9th of November, 1989, I was in Rochester, New York. When I heard the news, I had no idea that this was the beginning of radically new times. Thank you. I guess it is appropriate that I speak about taste just before lunch. And if you happen to dislike the lunch, I hope to demonstrate to you that there is still hope. Be calls. Breaking the wall of uh, bad taste, or rather, I think, opening up the wall to almost any taste is indeed possible. And I will show you some examples of that and explain some of the mechanisms. But uh, when we're talking about taste, we better sort of discuss what we mean by it. And you all know that we have five so-called basic tastes. Sweetness, you're familiar with sweetness, I guess. Saltiness, sourness, bitterness. And then this uh, other so-called fifth basic sense, umami. And I think that you will have a taste of a typical umami thing now, right? So if you pass these things around. Umami is a, a savory taste uh, associated with monosodium glutamate and small peptides. It's meaty and savory. And, and it has been found that in order to explain all of what the tongue can do with taste, uh, we need to include other tastes uh, than the four usual ones. But this is not taste on the tongue. This, what I'm talking about is really taste of foods. Uh, um, and when, when you have a cold, which I am sure you have had, your food has not tasted the way it should. And that's really because taste of food is not taste in the taste sensation from the tongue sense. Taste of food is really a highly complicated uh, interaction between uh, taste sensation from the tongue, smell from the nose, touch or tactile sensation, so-called mouth feel. You can tell the difference between a chewy thing and a non-chewy thing. And then also what we call trigeminality or chemistesis, which allows you to perceive hot spices. When all of this come together in the brain, uh, as this highly complicated figure on the left illustrates, uh, we refer to it as flavor. And Flavor, in a scientific sense, is really what we mean by the taste of the food we eat. So what we need to understand is flavor perception. Or maybe, rather than understanding flavor perception, we need to understand flavor appreciation. Uh, we heard about perception and attention just 10 minutes ago, and that's also very important here. But two of us can have the exact same percept of a thing. For example, this uh, cube is red to me, and I'm sure it is to you also, Stefan. But you might like it much more than I do, right? So appreciation does not follow immediately from perception. And uh, if we deal with how to change what we eat, either to get more pleasure or to be more healthy, less obese, we have to understand where preferences come from. And they could be coded uh, in our genome, and it seems as if 
Three of them are sweetness, the appreciation of sweetness, and the appreciation of fattiness, as well as the dislike of bitter taste. And this is very, very clever of nature to have put it together like that. Because if you think about what we eat from the first six months of our lives, it's mother's milk, right? And mother's milk is sweet and it's fat. So if you have an inborn acceptance mechanism or preference for sweet and fatty foods, you bypass the problem of, 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 of hard communication, verbally speaking, uh, with a baby. Uh, also, the dislike of bitter is, is, is highly uh, appropriate, since in nature, very many poisonous plants actually taste bitter. But, except for these three, mechan or these three examples, all the, rest of it, all the rest of it is learned. Which means that incidental learning, and by incidental I mean non-intentional, learning becomes important to understand um, if we want to change what, what we uh, should eat, either for health reasons or because we, want, we have other concerns. And there are a number of mechanisms uh, for preference change, and I'll give you, I'll show you some examples of all of them with real data, but mere exposure is also known in many other fields, but in, in, in sort of the food formation, food preference formation field, it means that just exposing an organism to a stimulus a sufficient number of times will have the organism appreciate that particular stimulus more. All right, very nifty organism, <laughs> mechanism. <laughs> uh, conditioned learning is well known to some of you, but if it's not, I will explain what it means. If you have a stimulus that you unconditionally like, and you pair it with another unknown one that you do not like uh, at the beginning, if you pair them into a mixture and has a human or an animal eat or consume this, then after, say, 10 uh, exposures to the mixture, if you take away the originally uh, unconditionally light stimulus, the organism will like uh, the new stimulus more. So it is as if uh, the nice properties of the unconditional stimulus has been taken over by, by, uh, by the initially uh, not light stimulus. Of course, that's not the case, but it is as if. So the brain has been recoded. It responds differently to the exposure with the unknown, in this case, food. Instead of using a well-liked flavor, you can also do this trick with energy. So if you add uh, fat uh, to an unknown food, and, uh, or an unknown flavor, and has the organism, the person, eat it, uh, eventually the, the energy and, and, uh, uh, will do the trick, because after the eating, you will feel energized, and that will, in mysterious way, uh, change your approach to the new flavor. That is called flavor nutrient learning. Uh, and there are other mechanisms, but I would rather uh, show you some examples of how this works and when it actually starts. And, and in the first slide here, uh, which is very, it's a very simple and extremely nice experiment performed by Pinoa Schall and his colleagues in France. Uh, and what they did was the following. 
they got two groups of, mother, uh, of pregnant women. And two weeks before they were to give birth, they offered the same meals to the two groups with only one exception, that one of the groups had a little bit of anise added to their foods. And they ate it. It's very common in France to add anise to their to foods. They, they were all very happy about it. And they gave birth to their children. Now, the test was performed on children or babies, newborn babies, uh, one to eight hours after birth, very early. And you see on, on the, the left panel uh, what they did. They took anise odor on a cotton stick and uh, put it next to the nose of the baby. And babies born from mothers who had consumed anise approached, had approach behavior towards the anise. Whereas well, those born to non-anise eating mothers repulsed, you know, moved away from it. So it seems that already in the fetal state, what we are exposed to in terms of flavor chemicals affect our approach behavior or our liking of flavors. And this continues uh, into the lactation phase, first half year of the child's life. He or she lives from mother's milk. And in, in the plot, we have shown that, that uh, chemicals, flavor chemicals, are transferred into the, uh, the milk, and that can be quantified, and we can measure delays. And if you, if you do these experiments with women, and, and, and the, uh, say there was mental there, if you have a group of women who uh, lactate children with mental in the milk, and another group of women who do not have this mental, then exactly like in, uh, in the fetal case, uh, children will have a higher preference for uh, mental in foods if the, if, if the mothers had this uh, in the milk. When we get older, between, in this case, this is data on, on two to three year olds, um, a completely unfamiliar, completely unknown food, and in this case, it was uh, artichoke puree, which is not eaten very much in, in, in Copenhagen. So to, to, to these children, uh, artichoke puree was really unknown, and they were unfamiliar <coughs> to it. And you see, uh, at the very first exposure, they managed to eat 20 grams of it, which is nothing, it's just what they spilled on the floor. Um, but after five to 10 exposures, they, they would happily eat this up to 120 grams. So this demonstrates that learning, incidental learning, takes place not only in the fetal state uh, or, or in the lactating, but also after, uh, after we, had, we have started to eat solid foods. And now he will get here very soon, right? Uh, um, oh boy. Uh, <laughs> this is a real cook. Food control mechanisms used to be food control mechanism, so-called homeostatic mechanisms, but it has been realized now that hedonic mechanisms are also very important. So there's a lot of research in neuroscience and psychology going into understanding what is reward. And that is good because we are faced with a challenge, if not only by sustainability concerns, they would seem to imply that we need to dramatically change the foods we eat. 
And, and, and as I hope this data has just suggested, but there's more to be read about in the literature if you're interested, it is certainly plausible. <laughs> <laughs> And, and it's a bit unfortunate, <coughs> yes, yes, it's a bit unfortunate that I, I don't really have time to show you these nice examples of highly unconventional foods. This is stuff you usually find on the beach, seaweed, right? But it can be turned into very nice foods. As uh, Ole Mauritsen, a physicist in Denmark and a highly inventive cook has demonstrated here, with something that, that is a bit like what you ate before, and it can be used to flavor all sorts of products. In, to a very nice, in, uh, so that they get much better than without them. So, we get stuff from the very bottom of the pyramid. We don't have to have it all pass through <laughs> an ox, and thank you, sir. Uh,